True story, I just bought a new car. And I must admit, I was a bit overwhelmed by all of its bells and whistles. I think I've only mastered about a quarter of the cool stuff my new car can do. But I must say, my last car was at least a decade and a half old. So a lot of these new applications and add-ons are completely new to me. What? You mean I can't lock my fob in my car? That's great! <laughs> but do you know what all of these fancy new automotive applications have in common? The need for dependable power distribution. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Mega trends and automotive designs have heavily influenced the requirements needed for vehicle architectures and power distribution systems. In this episode of Chalk Talk, Robert Pizzuti from Infineon and I investigate the trends and new use cases required for dependable power systems and how Infineon is advancing innovation in automotive designs with their ice driver and ProFit devices. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. Hi, Rob. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about dependable power distribution today and discussing some use cases to support fail operational and highly available systems. But Rob, before we get started, what end markets does dependable power distribution apply? Well, we're largely talking about automotive and transportation markets where you're dealing with, say, cars that have ADAS features or trucks that have ADAS features or autonomous drive features. But potentially these concepts could also be applied to safety systems where you have to maintain user or area safety for you know, robots or something like that. Okay. So what kind of trends are you seeing pushing the need for dependable power distribution? In the automotive space, we see three megatrends that are really changing the whole market for automotive. And those are connectivity and then security, where we're talking about vehicle communications, software over the air updates, and new infotainment options. And then certainly the whole shift to electric vehicles and electromobility going from internal combustion to battery variants, you know, mild hybrids, full batteries, those kind of things. And then automated drive is a real big part of the trends that are affecting the system. And the resulting changes here in targets is that we have changes in the market that are going to software-defined vehicles where automakers will be able to update and change the cars after sale without having them come to the dealer to do fixes and upgrades and even sell more features to the customer. We also have really a push to reduce the CO2 emissions or improve the efficiency of these vehicles and to address the automated drive and get to the point where the cars can drive themselves safely, we need to consider all of the things that go along with that, including different life cycle cases where, you know, the robotaxis might be running 24 hours a day instead of a car that runs maybe two hours a day. If you continue that and expand that to where semiconductor changes come in, you see that these huge changes affect the whole complexity of the car and how many wires and modules are in the car. So implementing semiconductors is essential to allowing the OEMs to simplify their vehicles and simplify their wire harnesses, to automate that wire harness assembly, which is now done manually, and to provide this, as I mentioned, fail operational and highly available power supply for these autonomous drive functions and safety functions. Okay, so before we go much farther, can you explain a bit about what exactly dependable power distribution is? Sure. Dependable power distribution is really the process of getting power from the sources to the consumers of that power and doing that in a way where you can prove with common engineering tools that that power will be reliable to be received. So, for example, if you have a power steering system in your car and you want to make sure that power steering system doesn't fail because perhaps the manual backup isn't possible or if the manual backups, you need to be um, muscle bound to turn the wheel because it's so much mechanical resistance. So what they do is they have a whole system of analyzing the use cases or the safety elements of that system and providing dependable power is one of those safety elements. So in one of the examples we're going to show, we'll say the system will providing two power supplies 
for that. And both power supplies are rated to ASIL standards. And then by combining two to the same module, you end up with an ASIL D system that is capable of driving these safety systems according to the norms. What exactly do you mean by use cases? Sure. So when we talk about use cases, the use cases that apply are how the parts interact with the car or how the parts are being applied to the actual implementation of the car. And when we talk about the historic use case of my product family that I'm referring to as intelligent power devices, these are to basically turn things on and off. And we do that with protection. So we fundamentally turn things on and off and we protect the device itself. The device we make is protected from being damaged in any abnormal use case. The system does not in itself protect the wires or the loads or the power supply. If that needs to be done, that has historically been done in cooperation with our part and a microprocessor. Where we start talking about new use cases is taking that same basic technology, that switch that has protection built in, and adding new functionality. That new functionality could be load supply protection, where we're protecting the supply to a load from being uh, pulled down and causing a broad failure. Could be wire protection, where we're replacing a fuse with a, a semiconductor device. Could be active during parking, where again, we're replacing a pass-through fuse that's powering a system all the time with a semiconductor device to keep a switch active and semiconductor takes current. And we need to have a use case where we minimize that current. We also have use cases for very high currents to connect and isolate and protect high current systems. So instead of being on the modules themselves driving individual loads, we're connecting the power sources between those modules and and in the system so that if you have two or three power sources that be maybe batteries, generators, DC to DCs, those can be protected and isolated in case of a failure. So what we'll talk about today is what those use cases are defined as and what solutions Infineon can offer to help implement those systems as automakers and tier ones move forward. Cool. Okay. So let's talk about some of those use cases in more detail. Sure. So if we go to the first use case slide, we talk about load supply and self-protection. And this is really a use case that's been around for 30 years since we started making these protected switches. And it really is to turn on and off a load and protect itself. So automakers wanted a way to turn on things like bulbs and have it be controllable and protected so that the module didn't need to be replaced if something happened, right? If there's an accident or something. And that's what we did. We delivered those for many years. And in fact, our current solution integrates this power switching with complete protection and enables things like current sensing and capability to drive high inrushes to drive bulbs and other capacitive loads. That family covers up to 40 amps. And we've just released this newest family of Profet Plus 2 and Spock Plus 2. And since 2018, which is when the full family got released, we've already sold over a billion of these parts. So it tells you how many parts like this that are in the car. And if you know anything about the automotive industry, it takes many years to get into the design. So, you know, these parts didn't start production generally until two years after our launch. And so we've really grown this device family because it's been so successful. If you want more information on those, you can type in the link in finion.com slash profet, and it'll take you to the website. So how do those look? Where do those go? If you look at any car, you'll find typically some kind of BCM. New cars that are being developed, they're replacing those with what's called zone modules. And in those zone modules, you might have a hundred of these load control and self-protect switches in the module, maybe even more in some cases. But they really just turn on things like bulbs, they activate uh, LEDs, they activate door locks, they control heaters, they turn on LED modules, et cetera. So these are really the backbone of what would be largely the functionality of your car. I mean, not the engine, but definitely everything that you touch and and handle, right, is, is being switched or controlled by one of these devices. And if we look at the portfolio, of our parts, we see that there's a very, very broad portfolio. In this case, the Profit Plus 2 family ranges from 1.2 milliohms with the purple parts at the top down to the equivalent 200 milliohm. It's actually a 60 milliohm part down at the bottom. And everything in the single and dual channel has footprint compatibility. 
So customers can switch easily between a single and a dual device or from one RDS on device to another if they have variations in their designs or if they have a late design change and need to change the current, for example. This is, as I said, been the, the most successful launch of HiSight Switch family ever, I think. And we've really gotten a lot of good feedback from all of our customers on the performance of these families. Fantastic. Now, you also mentioned load supply protection earlier as well, right? Can we take a closer look at that use case? Certainly, yes. This is a, an extension of the one I just talked about, the load control and self-protection The use case here is that it does protect the load and it protects itself, but in this case, it also protects the supply infrastructure. By supply, I mean the voltage supply. So what we did is we took our existing products and we implemented additional features like capacitive charging and adjustable current limits and reduced the operating voltage of these parts to support that. And our new family of Profet Load Guard products has those features integrated and those are available on our website. You can Google Infineon Load Guard and you'll be brought to that page. So if we look at what that means, the page here where we're giving an example of, let's say, an ADOS system that has a bunch of cameras and LIDARs in it. And in this case, it's maybe a little small to see, but there's an orange box kind of in the middle of the page that says DC to DC. And what's happening here is we're taking a 12-volt battery and reducing it down to 6 volts because these cameras often tend to be very, very small potentially even the size of a small pack of gum or something. They can't really consume a lot of current, don't have a lot of room to manage heat. So people are saying, okay, let's take the heat out of them and let's give them only the voltage that they need. Well, that's not a typical use for our previous devices. They typically switch 12 volts. So here we're switching 5 volts or 6 volts or 7 volts. And what happens there is that DC to DC is also much smaller capability-wise for current than a battery. So if you have a short circuit, say on camera one, that short circuit is going to increase that current significantly. And that increased current will pull down the DC to DC, will saturate the DC to DC and cause the whole voltage rail, that six volt voltage rail to fail. And in which case, not only the camera one failed because of the short, but all the cameras connected, in this case, in the picture camera two would fail as well because of a short on camera one. And that's not something that gives you dependable power. That's not something that allows you to have a safe system because you want redundancy and maybe both cameras are needed for redundancy. So if you lose both at the same time, that could result in an operating case where the vehicle can't move anymore. So what we do with our load supply protection parts is that we implement a current limit adjustment that shuts down or stops that part from pulling down the DC to DC. And by doing that, keeps the DC to DC voltage high enough to keep the other cameras connected to it operational. So it really isolates that failure from the rest of the system. And that's what we mean by load supply protection. We're protecting the supply to that particular load. Okay, so I believe you also mentioned wire protection as a use case as well. Can we talk about that one in a bit more depth? Sure. So wire protection goes along typically with active during parking. So those both tend to be connected at least in the operation that I've seen so far for existing designs. And wire protection is to provide inside the part a high-performance adjustable alternative to fuses and to protect wires. So fuses fundamentally protect the system, they protect the wires, but they're quite bad at it. I mean, they're historically been around for a long time, but they have very wide tolerances, they have aging effects, and they also can generate a lot of lost energy. We're replacing those fuses with a switch, and we're doing that with a fully specified curve that's adjustable and settable, and that's what the wire protection use case. The active during parking use case is really to keep those loads active when the car is parked, so you don't go to the airport for a -a once-in-a-lifetime three-week vacation and come back and find your car batteries dead. This is the use case here that we need to keep those loads active. In many cases, maybe it's a keyless entry or maybe it's some uh, sensor inside the car for intrusion. We keep those active with the minimum of current consumed in our device and therefore enable the same operation as a fuse used to, but with the added features of having diagnostics and, and being able to turn that fuse on and off. So the solution here is ISO compliant devices. So we talked about ASO ratings. ISO compliant devices help you achieve those ASO ratings. And we implement highly accurate adjustable I squared T curve. So I squared T is a mathematical indication of like a fuse curve, what that represents. Adjustable current limits, and I'll show more about that. And idle mode operation or low quiescent operation. 
And then really what we're looking here is fuses are autonomous. They don't need anything to control themselves. You could potentially implement a fuse curve with the microprocessor and the other devices we've talked about, but that doesn't meet the safety requirements. So this is software independent protection. And so the, the protection is handled strictly by the device. And for that solution, we have our Profit WireGuard that is coming soon. And there are some pre-information on the website. And as we post more information in the next couple months, you'll be able to keep looking out there and, you know, look at the beginning of the year and you should see a much more complete picture. Excellent. So how exactly does wire protection work? Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. So we have an animation to talk about that. So if you look at the animation on the next page, you see that there's a green line that is a load curve. So this load curve represents just average load curve. So there's some kind of inrush at the beginning when you first turn it on and maybe capacitors charge up or maybe it's a bulb and it has to heat up. And that inrush starts to decay over a short period of time. And then as you keep that load on for a longer time, and we're not talking about minutes, we're talking about you know fractions of seconds typically, it goes to a steady state current or the average current that goes to. So what we're trying to do is protect that system and protect the wires that go into that system. So there's a cross section of a 2.5 millimeter square wire that we would put in here and we'd map that also against current and time. And what we want to do is make sure that the system has enough capability to keep the load to turn on properly, but also protect that wire so that the wire doesn't overheat and melt. So we can implement this red curve, this solid red curve in the system that you can select, and that would give you that curve, it protect according to those lines. So if the current exceeded that level over that time period, the device would shut off. But inside our device, you can also change that curve. So you can move from that solid red curve to the dotted red curve. And that dotted red curve perhaps gives you better protection for your load because it limits the maximum current. And it also potentially allows you to use smaller wires, right? Because now, because we have a very tight tolerance specification versus a fuse, you can move the wire instead of using a two and a half millimeter cross section, you could potentially use a one and a half millimeter cross section. That's not a hundred percent of the case. There may be other reasons to use thicker wires, but fundamentally it enables that, right? Because of the accuracy and ability to attune those current and voltage curves. And then finally, we have the adjustable overcurrent protection that allows you to move the maximum current in to match more closely to your load. So in this case, we could now set the protection curve for this system, for this load drive on the dotted line that goes on the left side and then drop it straight down on the dotted line at the vertical axis. And this would be what I'm talking about with adjustable wire protection. And you can choose those curves to best match your system requirements, your load, your wire harness, et cetera. If we click one more time, we see what the active during parking mode really is about. In this case, if you turn the key off, potentially this load doesn't have a whole lot of operation mode anymore. It's maybe just in a monitoring stage or just in a sleep stage, but maybe it needs to wake up occasionally or maybe it needs to wake up when something sensor goes off or an interrupt happens. Well, that wake up may take a long time if it's completely dead and it may need to have a lot of communication to other parts of the car to get it to wake up. So Automakers have oftentimes used pass-through fuses or fuses to power these, and there's no switch involved. It's just the wire all the time. We're replacing that when the current is in a very low state. So here, maybe we're looking at 10% of the nominal load. The part goes into idle mode, and in idle mode, our part consumes a very low current out of its own ground pin. So the current to keep our logic and, and switch active is very low in the neighborhood of 30 microamps. So this allows you to keep that load switch on for long periods of time when the car is parked and not kill or drain the vehicle battery. If we look at an example of active during parking, what we could show you is Infineon's 60 gigahertz in cabin monitoring solution. And here, this solution is intended to monitor for left behind pets or children left behind in the car and make sure that they're safe and you are informed that they are in the car. But it also has another use where it could be detecting for intrusion, in which case that would be need to be on for a longer period of time after the key is off. And in that case, we need to keep that system powered and for uh, during key off mode, and we need to consume as little current as possible so that we don't drain the battery. And here in the top left box, you would see the switch that would power this module being used in active during parking mode. Excellent. Now, Rob, what about the other use cases you mentioned? 
Yeah, the other use cases tend to be higher current use cases. So we're talking not about switching an individual load, but switching a power network or a battery or DC to DC in the car. And so we have three additional use cases here, which is voltage isolation use case. So this is where you're isolating and protecting the interface between a DC to DC and its output voltage. So perhaps 48 to 12 volt DC to DC. And on the output of that 12 volt, you would put a switch using this VI use case to protect that system interface. Similarly, on the battery protection, you may have a 12 volt or a 48 volt lithium battery in the system. And those lithium batteries need to be well protected so that they don't have any adverse conditions due to shorts or overloads. And by putting the switch in, your battery management system can monitor and protect the system and completely isolate the system. So here we're talking about previous switches did not completely isolate. They always had some backwards conduction method through the body diode. Here we can implement a full back-to-back protection so you can completely stop all current from flowing. And then similarly in the PCI use case, we're connecting and isolating, if need be, different power nets in the car. So perhaps you have a high voltage battery that outputs to a DC to DC and use the VI system to isolate that. And then that becomes a network. Now you have a battery in the car as a backup supply for critical functions. And those two are connected through a PCI switch. And that PCI switch can be interrupted in case there's a fault on one side or the other to keep the system from being pulled down by a fault in one part of the system. Infineon has generally, because these are very high current, we integrated solutions are not possible. We develop gate drivers and we use Infineon's Optimus MOSFETs to implement these use cases. And, you know, we're talking about currents that could be 300 amps or more. So these gate drivers are designed to switch off quickly and drive, you know, 10, 12 parallel MOSFETs if need be. Uh, information can be available by Googling ICE drivers or ICE driver APD. An example of that would be ADOS system and autonomous drive system, where we have at the top left of this diagram, I realize it's a little small, we have two inputs, two power supply inputs. So one battery and one from another battery. And there we have in connecting those, we have two switches that are PCI switches. And in those switches, we're able to isolate one power supply if it fails so that you're not bringing down the whole system with a failure on one node of that power supply. So whether a battery gets disconnected or whether there's some short, we can still isolate that and keep this critical system, this autonomous drive system from operating. You know, these pieces that I talked about, these use cases, when implemented properly, make a highly available fail operational power distribution system. So the last use case is an area where we're still working, and this is about power supply protection. So When you talk about load supply protection, we're kind of protecting the power supply, but we're also shutting off the output when that happens. And in power supply protection, we're trying to keep the output active and protect the power supply. So it's a little combination. Right now, the use case is isolation protection of power supply from load disruptions. And basically what the solution would be is IPD devices with advanced monitoring, not only of current, but of the voltage and the power supply integrity and ability to set those values so that you can protect the system in a smart way. And honestly, that's still in development. We're still working on solutions. But for now, if the customer wants to do that, they would take one of our current ICE driver APD or Profet devices and implement that protection with a microprocessor because these type of products don't exist in the market. We're really developing new technology right now. So that'll be coming. But for now, this is the last use case that we see being required to implement for a fully fail operational, highly available power supply system. Excellent. All right. So Rob, this has been a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Certainly. So we see that mega trends in the automotive market are really accelerating the changes that are happening, where they be for uh, software defined vehicles, new architectures, changing the power distribution network of the system from what was electromechanical relays and fuses to fully electronic. These changes then require new functionality in the actual semiconductor devices. So that new functionality is really driving use cases that have to be implemented in hardware to deliver the requirements. And Infineon is investing and expanding our already market-leading portfolio to cover those use cases. And 
if people want to find more information, they can go to infineon.com slash power distribution, where that can start them on the journey for highly available power distribution systems. Excellent. Well, Rob, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for your time. Appreciate the questions. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Infineon. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talk section at EE Journal. You can't miss it, it's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. 